We know that kids have great ambitions. They want to go to college. At the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, we're obsessed with the same ambition to prepare all students in Silicon Valley for college and careers. The Step Up to Algebra program was designed to help middle school students that are going from 7th grade into 8th grade become more proficient in their algebra skills so that when they do go into 8th grade they're a lot more ready for the level of algebra that they're going to be doing. So the first day the kids come in and I read an attitude survey for them, uh, do you like math? Ugh. You know, this is summer school, you got to expect that. The Step Up to Algebra and the combination of Khan Academy has given them confidence and helped them get through that malaise of hating. And to see a student go home after summer school and do more math, to me that's success. I'm thinking that I'll get an A in math next year. I'm, I'm actually excited for school to start next year. Silicon Valley Education Foundation um, has provided an opportunity to many, many, many students. With their grant, we have now satisfied providing two classrooms at four different schools, and all those schools get a benefit. The teachers get to actually teach a material that is engaging for students. The students have now been exposed to science in a realm that they've never seen before. Well, before this program, I wasn't really into science. It was kind of difficult for me, and after I got into the program, it kind of helped. It was exciting. You learned a lot from this program. We know how to prepare these students for our college and careers. Now we invite the community to continue to support these programs so we can prepare more students. Because imagine a Silicon Valley where all our students are ready for college and careers. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Manny Barbera and I work with the Silicon Valley Education Foundation. I want to welcome you to our second annual STEM Summit. Uh, we think we have a very exciting program for you today that should be of interest to just about everyone in the audience from everything from um, high policy discussion to um, actual people who are doing the work in the schools and we want to welcome you and uh, thank you for choosing to be with us uh, this afternoon. I'm going to go through the agenda very, very quickly. Um, right now we're just uh, doing the introduction. We're going to start with our first panel and our first panel is going to be discussing STEM from a um, high level policy type of uh, uh, conversation. We then have with us, um, we're very fortunate to have with us the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlakson, who will um, give his vision. He's made STEM one of the primary focus areas for his um, administration. And then we're going to move to a more um, hands-on type of a panel with people who are doing some of the work in the schools. And then finally, we will move into our lightning round where you'll have an opportunity to be exposed to a lot of different um, STEM opportunities that are going on um, in the various schools. A little bit about our foundation. So <clears throat> the vision of our foundation is to transform Silicon Valley into a model for enhancing public education with our mission being that we will partner um, with public education in our school district so that all students will realize their potential. Now our primary objective is to partner with our districts so that students can be ready to graduate from high school, college and career ready. And we operationally define it as completing the UC CSU A to G requirements. So that's how we kind of measure, that's our primary metric. We do it three primary ways. One, through our advocacy uh, process, um, such as the event that you're seeing today, getting information out um, to, um, to people about various areas related to STEM. Um, we also advocate with districts to <coughs> adopt AG requirements as um, their default curriculum. And I want to acknowledge the districts that have done that already. Uh, we have with us, uh, you'll meet the Superintendent of the Eastside Union High School District in a little bit, but Eastside Union High School District, San Jose Unified, Palo Alto, Morgan Hill Unified, and most recently Gilroy Unified adopted higher standards uh, for their students and represents almost 60,000 students, um, high school students. So we want to acknowledge, acknowledge those districts. 
We do it through our programs. You saw a little bit about our Stepping Up to Algebra program, uh, which we're going to be have to be changing the name, by the way, as we move to Common Core. Um, we don't know if Stepping Up to Common Core doesn't, we don't get a really good acronym for that, so we're going to have to come up with something. Um, and then our Stepping Up to Science program, to uh, their intervention programs to help students prepare for, uh, in the case of Stepping Up to al Algebra at 8th grade, and in the science program to prepare them for biology, which is the first A to G lab science. And then through our resources of innovation, such as our iSTEM Teacher Corps, our Lessonopoly program, and then a relatively new website, um, a one-stop shop where we're uh, loading information, research uh, documents, and various programs that relate to STEM. So that's a little bit about us. So before we get started, we're going to do a little quiz. Um, who am who? Anyone have an idea who this? Per I don't really want you to respond. It's a hypothetical question. You can ask, but anyone have an idea who this might be? Take a look. Yeah. She was not on Dancing with the Stars, so that's not accurate. Here's a hint. Uh, she was called by Lord Byron the Princess of Parallelograms. Don't say the answer out loud. Don't, don't. You, shh, I think you got it. Hold on. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Uh, you got the first name right. I don't know about the last name. Here we go. Second, she uh, worked on Charles Babbage's early mechanical general purpose computer, the analytic engine. Right? Okay. And here's the last. She's often referred to as the first computer programmer. And she is Ada Lovelace. Okay. You got the Ada part. Ada Get in there. So. <laughs> and she was born in 1815. And the reason that um, she's being featured today is today is actually Ada Lovelace Day. So um, if you're thinking that we were clever enough to plan this event to match her day, thank you for having that kind of optimistic perception of us. We just lucked into it. So, uh, and I want to thank Jennifer Lee, uh, my colleague, who uh, uh, discovered that Ada Lovelace is, uh, this is her day today. All right. We are going to go ahead and get started with our first panel. I'm going to ask them to start coming up here. And, uh, but before we do that, I apologize. Before we do that, um, as I'm kind of need to follow my own agenda here, um, we are very fortunate to have a partnership um, with Microsoft that they've allowed us to use these absolutely wonderful, wonderful facilities. I can't think of a better venue. And I would like to introduce to you uh, Thea Smith-Nielsen, who is the Community Outreach Manager here at Microsoft, and she'd like to say a few words to you. So, Thea? Do you need this? Thanks, Manny. Thanks for uh, squeezing me in and giving me a few minutes of airtime here to just talk a little bit about Microsoft. But before I do, I'm kind of looking out and seeing that maybe we need to move a little bit. So I hate to ask you to do this. I'm sure you're all set up with your Windows devices plugged in and you're comfortable. But if you would, if you're able, just stand up and move toward the middle because we've got a lot of folks downstairs, as I understand it, who are getting checked in. And it'll be more comfortable for everyone, I think, if we can just let them in along the perimeter. There. Good, good. Perfect. There we go. Good, good. All right. Nice and cozy, so now we can really get started. On behalf of our uh, 2,800 Silicon Valley employees and almost 98,000 employees worldwide, welcome to Microsoft, and um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days to be here today to talk about the importance of integrated STEM education in our schools. At Microsoft, we do recognize how critical education is to our company, to our community, and to the world at large. So it is foundational, and we are thrilled to host the Silicon Valley Education Foundation's STEM Summit again this year for the second year. Every year, we host over 100 organizations on this campus to discuss issues of importance to the community, and there's no doubt about it that education is the highest priority topic for most of these convenings. 
We all recognize that we have an opportunity divide for youth today. In 2011, nearly 75 million people between the ages of 18 and 25 were unemployed, which equates to an unemployment rate of 12.7%, which is in fact double the rate for people over the age of 25. Um, here in California and around the world, new skills and experiences are needed for new economies. So the approach to educating and training young people needs to keep up with that, and it doesn't always. And so we really applaud the Education Foundation for partnering with districts and trying to, uh, to make changes where they need to be made. So while some people are prospering, those on the other side of that divide lack the skills, education, experiences, and connections to employment that are required not just to survive, but hopefully to thrive. There's great work underway to address this issue, being driven by many of you in this room. I see a lot of familiar faces from nonprofits we've worked with before, so welcome back. Good to see you again. And Microsoft is also doing our small part through our cross-company initiative that we call YouthSpark, which includes programs like Skype in the Classroom, Partners in Learning, DreamSpark, the Imagine Cup, to name a few. In its first year, YouthSpark served over 100 million youth worldwide, and we have a goal of reaching 300 million youth by 2015, thanks to the great work of organizations and individuals around the world working with us. Um, our national partners for this initiative are Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, Boys and Girls Clubs of America, City Year, Junior Achievement, and Year Up. And we work closely with the local chapters of these and other organizations that share our mission of helping youth realize their full potential. And while Microsoft has focused much of its philanthropic efforts toward overcoming this opportunity divide, we continue to support nonprofits in a variety of ways. Last year, for example, Microsoft contributed over $900 million in cash and software to NGOs globally, including tens of millions of dollars here in the Bay Area. Our U.S. employee giving program resulted in donations of $100 million to nonprofits. And over 80% of our employees here in Silicon Valley participated in this giving campaign, leading the company and setting the bar for employee participation in the community. So we're very proud of that. At Microsoft, every U.S. employee can match their charitable donations up to $12,000 annually. And they can also match their volunteer time at a rate of $17 per hour, which is sometimes more than the folks at these nonprofits are earning on an hourly wage. So having said all of this, we recognize that the most important work is being done by those of you in the room. So once again, thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, we're lucky to be in a position to support your work and we're honored to do so. So without further ado, we'll get our next speakers up here for you and kick off the program. Thanks. Thank you, Thea, and we really appreciate Microsoft's support um, for this and other events that we've held. Um, before I introduce our distinguished panel, I want to uh, point out to you that should you have questions during this particular um, panel or throughout the, the afternoon, uh, my colleague, Bob Nichols, um, will be distributing these cards and uh, you can write the question in, Bob will collect them and then we'll pass it on to the uh, moderator and, um, excuse me, pass them this way. He said this way, have to be one way. And um, so that we can then get the, get the questions to the uh, panel. Um, this is a terrific, terrific panel that we have here that's gonna be addressing STEM. It's sort of a large, um, looking at it from um, a larger landscape. And I would like to introduce um, first Chris Rowe, who's the CEO of the California STEM Learning Network. Tim Ritchie, the president of the Tech Museum of Innovation. Uh, Mo Kuwami, who is the president of San Jose State University, my alma mater. Wendy Godalowitz, who's the superintendent of the Cupertino Union School District. And the moderator will be the president and CEO of the Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley Education Foundation, Mohammed Chaudhry. So thank you so much for being with us. And Mohammed, I'll turn it thank over you. to you. Thank you. Thanks, Manny. So we're going to start off by talking to this great group about what is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and, and is there any value in integrating those letters, or is it a, are they standalone letters? How do we bring all this together? So I'd like to kick off by starting with Chris. Chris, can you define what STEM is, and, and in your or opening comments, if you can also share what does uh, CSLNet do um, in, in the area of STEM as well? Sure, well, it's a pleasure to be here today. It's really an exciting time for STEM education, so the, today's event is extremely timely. 
Uh, just really briefly, the California STEM Learning Network was founded in 2010. We're a nonprofit really that was created to help uh, bring together all of the amazing work that's happening across the entire state in STEM education. So we think of ourselves as really a big umbrella organization. We're a network of networks. Uh, we work with uh, partners all across the state uh, to really advance STEM education and make California uh, one of the top uh, STEM education states in the country. Um, and thank you for all your work in getting next, gen next generation science standards passed. Um, well, I can't take a whole lot of credit for that, but uh, it was really, um, and we can talk more about that later, it was really a team effort with a lot of folks, a lot of business support, which I think was really, really critical to getting next generation science standards passed uh, for California. Um, to get back to your question about STEM, um, this is something that we as a network have really grappled with, and some of you may have participated on the superintendents, and I know he's going to talk shortly, uh, his STEM task force, where we took up the same question, how do, we, um, how do we think about STEM? And we think about STEM really as an integrated approach. Uh, we do believe that there is uh, the disciplinary focus that's really important in each of those disciplines, in science, math, engineering, and technology. Each one of those disciplines stands on its own. But where STEM gets really exciting and interesting is at the intersection of those different disciplines. And when you add in project-based work like STEM education, when we're really thinking about what's happening in the real world, real world contexts, that's where STEM gets really exciting. And it's the kinds of skills and knowledge uh, largely that are happening through the introduction of the Common Core, including math and ELA, but now next generation science standards, which really I think are going to allow us to begin truly integrating these disciplines uh, in both the formal settings We've seen a lot of this work happening in informal settings, and I, I'm guessing that Tim is going to talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, so I think it's a really exciting time for the state. I think we're at this dramatic right. turning point uh, when it comes to STEM, and particularly with respect to STEM integration. Great. Before we go on, we're going to be integrating technology into this conversation. So if you'd like to tweet, if you'd like to check in on Facebook, if you'd like to use Instagram, go and take pictures of us now. We, we like our pictures taken. Uh, and please tweet your questions. We'll see your questions through that as well. With that, um, com coming over to you, um, President Kayumi, I love your first name, by the way. <laughs> um, what San Jose State is known, at, or some people may not know, it, it graduates more engineers than all the other universities in the Bay Area combined. Um, and you're doing a lot of work in the E. Um, to tell me how, what, what else is San Jose State doing in their, in their um, College of Education and other areas to integrate STEM to work on science, technology, engineering, and math? Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. What well, San Jose State, being in the heart of Silicon Valley and uh, an urban-serving university, we see our role in uh, three key areas. First, how we can build the workforce of the region. Second, how we can enhance the economic vibrancy of the region. And third, how we can really build thriving and healthy communities. And as part of that one, an institution that more than 50% of our students come from the area and over 80% of our graduates live and work in the region, uh, the industries that we have in the region, the needs of the region is very tied in to the programs that we have. And being in an area that uh, technology and entrepreneurship has really been in the core of it and the, uh, as part of it, STEM education, uh, we look at STEM education in a number of different ways. One. Uh, making sure that we have the degree programs that really meets the needs of the region, such as, as you mentioned, the engineering, but not only engineering, all of the life sciences, uh, physical sciences, uh, business, uh, uh, and uh, health sciences overall. So that's one aspect of it. Uh, the second aspect of it, since we graduate the largest number of uh, uh, school teachers in, uh, in Santa Clara County, our College of Education is very much connected to all of the school districts, and uh, we're really looking at uh, we've already been working for the last year to see how we can really work ourselves and get ourselves ready for the common core and new uh, science uh, standards. And third, uh, we try to look at STEM as a competency that basically every area uh, in the university, every uh, college graduate should have some, of the, some understanding of STEM. And I, you know, I would like to challenge it in the other way. Show me a sec uh, single field or any professional who will not need some STEM competency. So this is almost one of the uh, competencies that every individual uh, as a survival skill, uh, they need to have it. And finally, basically, a few key areas that we have started working at the university, some new initiative uh, regarding STEM is a new initiative regarding cybersecurity, big data, 
analytics and also specific programs to see how we can uh, reach out to the underserved community in a specific program for STEM for Girls that we'll be working with uh, uh, middle school districts. But President Kayumi, shouldn't STEM really be STEAM, add the arts in there or STREAM and add a little history in there? Why are we still just calling it STEM? Well, I give you my biased opinion, and that is uh, uh, that really, sh I think those individuals who, you know, ask that one do not have a very strong understanding of what liberal education really means. I'm because sorry. if you go back to the roots of education, of course, you and I talked about this question a little bit, but if you look, uh, go back to the roots of uh, liberal education with Capella in 17th century, it gets to the two words of, uh, you know, trivium and quadrivium. I mean, trivium, basically the three elements of, uh, uh, of uh, grammar, uh, logic and uh, rhetorics, and when we talk about uh, quadrivium, it was uh, numbers, numbers and time, numbers and space, numbers and time and space, which of course numbers and time makes, uh, that's uh, discipline of music. When we talk about numbers and space, that's geometry, numbers and space, and uh, time was astronomy. So I think if you look at liberal education in that context, you know, it, science and liberal and all of the other uh, humanities and social science are, are integrated in a very eloquent uh, way. So uh, in one of the hard eggs that I have even with the AAC News, a leap in the 2000, uh, and 21st century competencies that set, uh, put, uh, set forth, they have included STEM, but in such a way that you need an electronic microscope to find it. So uh, I think, you know, to me, the, uh, STEM is an integral part of liberal education and how you can really separate it from all of the other aspects of liberal education and it's really, uh, I really find it quite puzzling. So to me, STEM is uh, the heart and the essence of quadrivium, basically. Great, thank you. So, Tim, um, the Tech Museum, you've got the T down. Should we be changing the name to the STEM Museum? Um, what, what, what is the Tech Museum doing and, and how are you integrating the other three letters as well? So I'm glad you brought up the question about our name because what we should do is lose the word museum. Uh, and I'll talk about that okay. for a second. So the tech did not begin as a museum. The tech began 27 years ago as a science challenge called the Tech Challenge. So we began as a project-based learning institution which was all about solving a problem using science, technology, engineering, and math. This is the 27th year, and, and since, since that time, the museum was created, but it's the museum that's the problem. Because at the tech, you will have an in innovation experience. At the tech, you will have an opportunity to do uh, project-based learning on the floor. So really, the name should be changed to something like the tech innovation experience, because that's where you'll come, and that's the, really the gift we can play, and that a lot of uh, institutions, informal institutions like ours can play. So at the tech, both on the Tim, can, can you jump into this? What is the, an informal versus formal? So I'm simply separating the uh, K-12 system, which is in the classroom, as formal, I'm calling. And informal would be out-of-school time activities uh, in places that, that take place in museums or, gosh, in so many other places around that aren't in the K-12 system. So that's what I mean, formal okay. versus informal. And at the tech, we have both programs outside the institution like the Tech Challenge, which I would encourage all of the schools who are represented here to consider being a part of, because it's a very low barrier to entry STEM uh, project-based challenge that uh, really is effective in introducing science, technology, engineering, and math. But also on the floor, we have uh, uh, innovation experience, design challenge experiences on our lower level that also present challenges that really encourage visitors to use 21st century skills, collaboration, uh, working uh, uh, with applied technology, solving problems, getting better, failing fast, iterating, all that stuff that we are trying to do with the Common Core, you can experience on the exhibit floor. So the real challenge here is for us to, in fact, integrate STEM in project-based learning. That's probably the greatest gift that tech has, both with respect to tech challenge and what we do on the exhibit floor. And Tim, if, if I've got kids who are struggling, who are behind in my K-12 system, as, uh, if, I was, if I was a great superintendent like yeah. Wendy, why would I go to an informal place rather than keeping them in the classroom longer and, and get them more math inside or more science inside there? Is there any research that shows that informal places work? That's a great question. I'm not entirely sure about the research on that question, but what I would say is that there's a lot of research about the importance of success and engagement. 
a, a student who is engaged and is successful will develop a desire to persist. So the whole idea of the relationship between quick success, deep engagement, and long persistence is something that, that the data is very clear about. The relationship between that data and what happens in museums is another question. I think we know as a matter of our own common experience that when people are engaged in solving problems, they experience success doing it and they persist in it, then they will learn the underlying things they need to do to be successful. That's great. Thank you. So Wendy, you've heard, you've heard from, from these folks um, who, are, who are attacking the problem from different angles. What, what are you doing in, 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 a, in a school district to, to support STEM and to integrate STEM inside in the classroom? Well, I think in, in Cupertino, we're just embarking on that question ourselves. But one of the things I want to draw attention to is t to tie in a lot of what they said. We have one school in Cupertino when I arrived for the very first time, stepped into the school not knowing what it was. Uh, it was an altern one of our alternative sites. I thought my, I left that day thinking this is what school should be. And so what was that? It was a little bit of all of what these gentlemen shared. So it is a school where everything that the students do every day is integrated. The science, the technology, engineering, math, writing, reading, it's all integrated. The students have flexibility and choice every single day in their learning. Students are not sitting in classrooms of 30. Um, in fact, they're all over the school all the time. So if you walked into the school, you might say, is this really a school? Um, they are given as many formal opportunities as they are informal opportunities. So they spend uh, probably close to half of their time off of the campus experiencing what it is to live on a farm, to spend a week's camping, to be pioneers hiking for half a day just to get down to a particular location. They're working with mare roves. They're working with, ro with robotics. They are using Tinker. Uh, they are prob problem solving each and every day. And what's interesting about them is they don't call themselves a STEM school. That's but great. in fact, they are. Uh, but we don't talk about them that way. So I think for us, it's we can't just simply replicate that school because that's a big leap uh, for anyone in our district. In fact, when we talk about it, there's a little bit of a, a hesitancy on the part of others to really think about what they're doing. But their motto is that you experience the content versus being taught the content. And I think that's where we need to go as a district, and that's really where we're headed, is how do we begin to integrate across the board instead of having silos? Right. So President Kayumi, that, that sets up my next, next question for you. Um, we, we see that students coming into San Jose State, the remediation issue, Tim talked a little bit about grit or persistence. I mean, there's lots of things to do to make a child successful in 21st century skills. Look out 10 years for me. What does, what does a classroom look like? What does teaching look like in a, in a real classroom in Silicon Valley 10 years from now with all these technology tools coming? I mean, I can, I can list off lots and lots of them, but what changes? Do we still have six rows and five kids in each row? Or, or is, is it gonna evolve now? Well, I think teaching might remain the same, but hopefully learning will change because teaching has really remained the same for the last 2,000 years. And what we really need, to, uh, and I think as I look at uh, to the future, uh, because of the fact that uh, students are coming in an environment that content is free, ubiquitous, and available to all of them at any time of day or night. So they're not looking, for, uh, the content is something that they can do on their own. But what the cl uh, classroom really becomes, or the, a learning environment, and again, because even using the word classroom, when we talk about learning, formal and informal learning, that the word classroom becomes almost uh, problematic. But any learning environment is going to be very vibrant. It's going to be an environment that uh, uh, the learners are not only uh, you know, the acquiring new, uh, new uh, techniques, but also contributing. So they're both uh, generators as well as, uh, as, well as consumers of that, uh, that uh, uh, new uh, know-how. And as part of that one, we will really get uh, learning to really be uh, individualized, to be uh, very engaging, and uh, to be in an, and also hopefully with uh, the advent of uh, big data and uh, analytics, we'll be able to learn more about, you know, rather than an anecdotes that we have about learning, how people really learn, what are the things that really make one individual excited versus turning off another person, and how we can really get a curriculum in a way that people move at the speed that they are comfortable and they can. I mean, unfortunately, our 
current schooling system is basically based on age uh, discrimination, based on whatever age you are, that's the group that you put you in. And rather than, you know, some people can, maybe there are certain topics that one student can learn much faster and some other topics they can't. So I think that's the kind of environment that we can really see where learning would really become something very exciting, something very engaging, and something that every person can move at their own speed where we get out of this uh, uh, very compartmentalized approach that we currently so, so have. So what, what are the type of tools? Is Khan Academy a tool that, that teachers should be using? What are some tools that you, you believe uh, should actually be used? I think uh, any and all. Uh, you know, first of all, we have to look at, uh, expand uh, the, edu uh, the, uh, the whole role of educational providers. Uh, I think as uh, uh, Tim mentioned, uh, talking about museums, talking about libraries, talking about uh, uh, zoos, talking about uh, theaters, uh, talking about national labs, talking about corporations, foundations, and all different entities. They're all uh, content providers. We have to see how we can really bring all of that together and really begin looking at uh, building the electronic portfolios because I think that's basically where the future will comes really together. be. And as part of that one, the fact that we look at more uh, uh, big data will, to really give us a better understanding of how individuals learn. What, what is big data? Well, big data is bigger. You know, is any type of data far more than could be uh, looked at in the traditional uh, uh, query models that we're used to. And uh, in terms of, uh, I think, in the learning process, unfortunately, we, the learning process up to now has been very uh, thin science in the I sense see. that we have working, we have been working more with anecdotes than actual. Uh, fact-based and the uh, idea and especially I think one of the things that online education really provides for us is far more data to see how people learn what are the things that gets people excited how thing is you know, you know going back to the tech museum uh, you know if you have uh, systems to really show what are the what are those particular experiments that really gets uh, students excited how much time they spent what did they learn from it if they come next time how will they look at that same experience. I think all of these are the kind of both uh, cognitive and uh, non-cognitive. Uh, so, so you're counting keystrokes instead of looking at test scores, Oh, right? absolutely, yeah. because uh, um, unfortunately in many systems, measurement uh, becomes counting, and measurement, measuring is not really counting. It's far more, uh, far more sophisticated Great. than that. Great, Lam. Tim, coming over to you, 10 years from now, how much time do Wendy's kids spend at the tech uh, note, I've changed my, the name as well. Um, and and uh, what's going on? What happens? What, what looks different in the informal experience beyond the tech as well as, as uh, President Kayemi talked about? There's lots of organizations coming together. Um, what, is it, what does the world look like in 10 years? Well, I think the world looks differently. And the reason is because it, at some point, maybe now, people ask the question, what are the really big problems that need to be solved? Because that's really part of the point of education is we try to prepare people now to solve really big problems in the future. And when you think about that, what you find out is what this integrated, why it's so important is that the really big problems of the future will be solved not by really primarily by basic science or by basic math. It's going to be the technology and the engineering challenges. So we're going to hopefully focus now on technology and engineering as a way to integrate stuff through actually focusing on real projects to be solved so that the, the basic sciences are integrated. So what will happen 10 years from now is that there will be a great deal of project-based learning, that there will be a great deal of real um, skills being developed. For, for instance, one now, we would all know it, but how, many, how much is it taught in the school? about coding, for instance. Mm -hmm. Coding as a language, as a way of doing things, is hardly something that's commonly experienced in the classroom. But we all know that it should be, because it is how we will solve problems in the future. So hopefully, the whole project-based learning thing will come up. The second thing that will have happened, hopefully, is the maker movement and, the, and the, that kind of thing will continue to gain great ground, because it builds creative confidence. So that the creative confidence that happens in the classroom will produce people who will take on big challenges and will do the kind of thing that we do naturally in Silicon Valley. So to the extent that the, uh, the, the schools are transformed to work on project-based learning, the 
that build creative confidence, that use real world skills, especially engineering and technology. And then the basic sciences come in drafting behind that rather than on top of it. That's what I would say some of the big challenges. So how often should I be taking my kids to, to the tech? I mean, what, is it, what does that look like? And so that's a great question. Um, I, and there I think are two, that, by the way. Yeah, there are two answers. There's, I mean, there's two questions. No, oh, I have oh twins. two children. <laughs> and and they're, aren't they twins? They're twins, yes. Oh, gosh, that counts as four. <laughs> um, so hopefully your twins will be coming to the tech in partnership with their schools. And so that we will be working in partnership with teachers on project-based learning. We'll be working in partnership with teachers in things like the Tech Challenge and stuff during the day. So hopefully your kids will be coming without you. And then in the afternoons, you could come, and on the weekends, of course. But the big, big shift that we want to see happen at the Tech will be where we will be visitor-facing by day and community-facing by night. So that we will reopen the doors of the Tech and that we'll be open again from 6 on where then community groups and, and perhaps you and your family could come at that point so that we become a real resource for innovation. So hopefully we can become a resource to you with your kids in school and then with your, uh, with your groups and with your family at night. And my wife will be coming to see Star Wars. So yes, sure. Star Wars starts this weekend. <laughs> so, Chris, across the state, what, what does it look like? I mean, um, you, you heard from President Kayumi, you, you heard from... Um, Tim, what, what does the, uh, how are we doing as a region relative to other regions across the state? I mean, ten, are we 10 years behind, uh, God forbid, Southern California? Are we, are we ahead? Where are we? Well, that's a great question. Uh, just so for those of you that don't know, the California STEM Learning Network, as I mentioned, is a network of networks. And we are really built uh, on the foundation of regional networks across the state. And we're pleased to be partnering with SVF here in, in Silicon Valley as a regional network, but we have nine and f nine existing regional networks and probably four or five more that are all anxious to come on board in the next year to be part of a really large statewide peer learning network around STEM education. So uh, we have some tremendous assets around the state and some really interesting things happening. Um, I'm going to get down to the basic definition of STEM, and, and President Kiyomi talk, talked a little bit about that. I talked a little bit about what does that look like. I think in each region they define that somewhat differently. If you start with that as a common, a common definition, it looks different in the North State, and we've got a group up there that's really excited to get a regional network running uh, up in Northern California. Uh, we've got a group in Los Angeles that has a real strong uh, focus with uh, industry around uh, the entertainment industry but also the aerospace industry, which has been a huge, long-time anchor in the What are they the doing? LA what, what, what are others doing that we may not be doing here that we can all learn from? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it comes down to some, some real similarities, and each region does think they're slightly different, but when it comes down to really helping kids through project-based learning, uh, helping uh, students really understand what are the big issues in that region. So in some regions, we have some very rural regions who have a big focus on ag, and that sometimes wants to get thrown in as, a, as another A into the <laughs> STEM, into, into STEAM, uh, it, rather than the arts, sometimes is ag. Uh, but it comes down to really equipping students with the types of skills, the really the kind of problem-solving skills, the STEM skills around thinking, the creativity aspects, and really being able to apply that to if it's in, in ag uh, economy in the Fresno area or a logistics uh, economy in the Inland Empire, which is huge down there. They have a huge uh, advanced manufacturing economy that's desperate for highly skilled uh, workers at this point. Um, so that each region, uh, I think, has a slightly different vision for what it looks like than Silicon Valley. Um, we don't really compare our regions. We're trying to get some, some underlying but metrics. But if you had to pick the best, you would, you, uh, you would pick uh, naturally. I might, I might, yeah. I might be able to pick Silicon Valley. No, I think T you have... TS spends $98 million a year, <laughs> so... Uh. No, Silicon Valley has a tremendous amount of assets and, and, and a leg up on many regions of the state. I know that a lot of regions look to Silicon Valley with envy because of the kinds of assets that you have here in terms of your leadership and, and your... Right. your the tech and the other kinds of uh, resources that you have available, as well as your business community is a huge asset to this region that a lot of other uh, areas don't have. And they look at Silicon Valley and they ask you, what do you guys do differently? How do you partner with businesses? Uh, and in some areas of the state, that's tougher because they don't have the kind of 
robust uh, uh, backbone infrastructure with the uh, economic powerhouses like Microsoft and, and the sense. others in the region. So, so Wendy, there's a, there's a, there's a posting on on Twitter by Hillary Ditto talking about all schools should be STEM schools. You just talk, you just heard their vision for 10 years from now. How far? I mean, Cupertino is an outstanding school district, um, uh, particularly with the addition of Amy Wong on your team. Um, but but how far are we from? Um, from this vision, are we ten? Are we? Is this going to take ten years, or can we do this in two years? How close are we to the vision that these gentlemen just laid out? Well, I, it's not going to happen in two. Okay. Um, it, it, and I think this is true of most school districts. So we can say we're an outstanding school district. We are. Amy's going to help lift us up um, in this area. But what we've seen is we're outstanding. Um, based on where we all are as school districts throughout the state and the country as of this moment in time. So we're about to make that shift with everyone else. And so when we say, did our students in Cupertino perform very well on a CST, which is standardized, multiple choice, yes, they, they perform, we're third highest in the state as far as our students' performance as a district. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean our students are geared up and ready for the level of problem solving that we're talking about. And so that's what we're beginning to work on. So we can say we have a very strong mathematics program right now. 100% mm -hmm. of our geometry students score a, a proficient or advanced. Are there any schools, I mean, going beyond Cupertino, are there any schools that look like what these gentlemen talked about already? Well, the one school I was referring to in our yeah. district absolutely does. That's and great. so there are not roads. Name, name the school. The, the school, and you all want to go see it. Yeah. Um, it's called McAuliffe. Okay. And it is a, based on a constructivist model, and it's experiential, and it looks exactly like what they were describing. So it's based on problem solving. It's based on student choice. Uh, the teaching is vastly different because mentors are in that school each and every day. You can't tell the difference between the teacher, the mentor, the parent. Um, students actually construct some of their own learning opportunities. So it's not just the teachers informing uh, what the students will learn. Students become teachers themselves. Um, and it is all project based. And um, let me open up the next question with you, and then we'll go, we'll go down, down the road. What, uh, what is Common Core, and is it really coming? <laughs> it better be coming. We've been telling our teachers it's here. So uh, yes, it is really coming, and it's a new set of standards. And the, the idea of STEM and Common Core um, I think is a real one, and it's a, it's a natural launch for us to, to make that transition, and that's how we're approaching it in Cupertino. We've put a lot of resources into beefing up our technology, our math and science areas of instruction, so that we can get geared up and ready. One of the things I, I have to say, though, is that as I'm very optimistic, because I think that there are uh, a lot of uh, aligning uh, points or, or areas within the Common Core and STEM. I think it's natural. You have the mathematical it, practices. You have the focus on nonfiction. So I think all of it's there. But I think there's also an area for caution. If, in fact, we look at the Common Core State Standards and we say to ourselves, uh, what is the same as the previous set of standards, we can be in trouble. And so what I think we ought to be really focusing in on is really what's the difference. What is the difference? And we leverage the difference and move ourselves forward and out of where we are now so that we don't stay stuck. So in 10 years from now, we're not sitting in rows, we're not doing worksheets with our kids 80% of the time, um, that it's not drill and kill, and we're not asking students to strictly get a single answer and memorize, but we're asking them to think critically, we're asking them to solve problems, we're asking them to collaborate with each, with each other authentically. And I consider the entire process uh, what is natural learning. So n none of this is really unique if you watch a three and four year old. If we yeah. would just go back to what it looks like when a three and four year old learn, we're all learners, let them learn. What we've done is we've stopped that. President Kayumi, um, we've got 13,000 teachers in Santa Clara County alone. And if yes. you include other regions, um, that's a large number. Now, uh, Superintendent Torlickson and the governor, they, they spend, they give a little bit of money, $200 per student, so to, to help roll out Common Core, but that's not going to be enough. How is San Jose State going to, A, help prepare all these current teachers, um, or who is preparing all these current teachers? And secondly, won't STEM and integrated STEM be put in the back burner while we try to implement this massive change in education? Well, I don't think you can really separate the two. I mean, they, you know, you have to work, uh, both of them are uh, an integrated issue. 
Uh, what you have started at San Jose State for the past year as part of our uh, College of Education curriculum and getting ready for Common Core is uh, what are the changes that we need to bring and see how we, uh, for the licensure, how we can really uh, concentrate our efforts on the concepts rather than procedures, how we can uh, really try to uh, uh, bring a more integrative learning as part of, as part of the process. So, so one aspect is what we can really do to get uh, uh, the new teachers that will be coming and uh, that will be graduating. How we can pre prepare them. The second aspect is uh, looking at for end service. What are some of the specific programs that we can put together for summers for certificates and and hopefully. Uh, both using online as well as face-to-face -face and other ways that we can pr have programs available where our existing uh, teachers would be able to utilize that one. And as part of it, also try to have a data bank of information in terms of, of new practices to see which ones really work and how we can really leverage on the collective uh, knowledge base uh, that our region have and beyond. And let me open up to where does technology play in all this? We've talked about technology. I think technology as a means and helping in this area is going to play a major role and that's, uh, you know, as I mentioned about collecting that information, uh, trying to have as much of the program as possible for online, it's going to be helpful. For instance, we are starting our educational doctorate uh, in, the, in the fall. But our plan is to look at the, this educational doctorate to be primarily, you know, mostly online. So uh, many professionals will be able to uh, will be able to benefit from it while they're still uh, continuing their recurring uh, position. So, uh, uh, and also at San Jose State, we have uh, we've installed, uh, you know, made quite a bit of investment in uh, telepresence. Uh, so we'll be able to bring students and pro professors from all over the world uh, or any region. To work with us, and also for many of our um, practices right now, when when uh, students go for their practicum, the faculty member can you know can uh, uh, watch uh, observe that class on online as well as have a record of that That's one, great. so they can go over with the students. So I think there are many ways that we're using technologies in this. That's way. great. Using telepresence, Cisco products. Yes. Sandra Wheatley's in the room. If you'd like a telepresence, just ask her. She's she she she'd be happy to give you one as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chris, Chris, so. Common Core is math and English. Um, and there's no there's no science standards in there. And then uh, what happened? And what are we doing about that? Well, we have the Next Generation Science Standards, which wow. were just approved in September. And uh, I think we need to again uh, congratulate uh, our leadership here in the state. California was the sixth state nationally to approve Next Generation Science Standards, and they were developed in a similar process with the Common Core. Not exactly the same process, but a very similar process by which 26 states collaborated around the nation to develop these standards. They're, they're world-class standards. We looked at what other countries were doing, and again, kind of what we were not doing here in the United States compared to some of those high-performing countries in the science areas. And it came down a lot to relevance. It came down to a lot to applied. And can students actually use what they're learning in the classroom and apply it? And we found that, uh, generally speaking, while we have theoretically high standards in California in the science areas, we're finding that we are, our standards were really uh, an inch deep and a mile wide, and we weren't really expecting students to be able to display mastery of the types of skills and be able to apply them. So the new science standards were just approved. We have a long trajectory in, ahead of us. And so I'm they were sure approved after the Common Core standards. That's right. So the Common Core standards were approved, I believe, in 2010, and we've been working really for about three years to get ramped up to implementation, which is now again through leadership here in the state with the, the superintendent and the governor and assemblywoman Susan Bonilla who've been real key in helping secure dollars and, and really leveraging uh, that to be able to roll this out. Science is coming next and they're designed to be integrated. So it's a very elegant design that the science standards are really designed to find those cross-cutting concepts and where the fit is with the math and with the English I language see. arts That's as well. Great. And they're actually built right into those standards, which will then be turned into curriculum and instructional materials and so forth over the next two to three years. Very exciting time. That's, that, that's uh, going to be a lot of fun implementing. Um, so, Tim, uh, you've got a lot, a lot of folks uh, in the audience who are from the informal, informal space, a lot, lot, lot of great providers. There's a lot of superintendents in the audience as well or, and other educators from, from school districts. What are the challenges of connecting the informal and the formal space? You talked about that from the, the text perspective, but, but in general, what are the challenges? And more importantly, how do we overcome those challenges so, so it can be somewhat of a seamless experience um, um, between those two worlds? 
So I have a lot of answers to that question. I do think the Common Core and the Next Generation Science Centers will make it easier to do that because places like the tech can be a resource to schools to do what now you are being asked to do. So we can be a resource to help you live out the Common Core and, and to meet those standards and to meet the standards of the new generation science standards. So that will be a lot easier now than in the past generation. I think the other thing, and this is a more theoretical answer to your question, is that the place where the informal community and the formal community should meet is the place where we started to begin with. We all went into the learning business. We're all here because it's joyful. It is the place where we find joy. And I think when we do projects that are difficult to do, that are fun to solve, that if we can meet at that place, if we can meet at the place of joy and engagement, then we will in fact do some great work together. And I think that the new generation sort of is setting us up to do that well because real world problems, when you solve them, it's a lot of fun, it's joyful. And that's a place where we should, we should not forget that because it's so easy to forget that in the midst of trying to meet all the standards about uh, this and that test and so forth and so on. But informal institutions like the tech can meet formal institutions in a place of joy. And I think that's the best place to Great. try to head. So, so, Wendy, I mean, I think we're talking about great stuff, but sometimes the, the STEM, integrated STEM technology, um, it, it comes down to, it, it, it further divides the achievement gap and those underprivileged kids that don't have that access technology, that don't, can't easily get to the tech or to, to our other great institutions. How do, how do we make sure that that doesn't happen, and not only rolling out these new common core and whatnot, but just, STEM in general, integrating STEM, that, that we don't further divide um, our students. Yeah, I, if, if you looked at my bio, I, I spent a few years in Oakland, and now I'm in Cupertino. So there's that's right. a vast divide. Um, and in, in coming into Cupertino, it was the, the first opportunity I had to be in, in a more affluent um, community. And so in stepping in, I said to myself, what, what is different here than everywhere else? And access was it. So access meant multiple things. Access meant in the, inside the classroom, um, what was happening and what was offered to students. So uh, in a place like Cupertino, science was never left out. Um, technology was not entirely left out, but wasn't given the uh, leverage that it should have been given, but it was there. Uh, the exposure to the electives, the arts, the music never went away. And so those kinds of things were available to students throughout the economic crisis that we are somewhat getting over. Um, in my time in Oakland, I noticed a lot of those things weren't there, that the fixation became reading and writing, and that is important, reading, writing, and math, of course. But what happens with the whole child, I think, was left out. Within a, a district like Cupertino, the question would be, do we have gaps? Absolutely. So we have achievement gap very similar to what other districts would have. And I think, again, it, ha it really does have to do with access, and it's around... And now with local control funding formula, will, will, will that bridge be, be, be uh, conquered? Uh, probably not for us, because for, we're... For the, for the underprivileged yes, uh, district. For, for, yes, for those, uh, th there will be added funding. But the question is, again, just money doesn't do it. I mean, we, we talk as if, we, if money is the answer. It's what you do with the money that is the answer. And if we fall into the same old traps, then you're not going to close that gap. So really... But people should give more money. They should get. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not saying they shouldn't. But the question is, what are you doing with the money? And right. that's really the question. The question is, how Smart. do you take those funds and ensure that all children, particularly children who don't have access both in school and out of school, who aren't taking those trips, who can't get to the tech, what happens to them? Okay. And how do we structure our days so that we excite children rather than deter them from the curriculums, okay. making them sit and listen? Mm -hmm. And then the last one is, how are we giving access to the students within the system as far as the courses that they take? <laughs> because at a very young age, we start to, to tell children, you can't do something. And how do you, great answer. Um, Question, Crystal. Uh, we'll just, we're going to go a little faster. Chris, I'll bring it to you. So we're talking about all these things, and we typically these programs um, help the underprivileged kids. Are there programs out there in STEM for the for the gifted kids um, who are ahead and help them get get further ahead, um, or, or or everything we do is is typically for the kids who are behind and get them to grade level or get them to the get them to the average. That's a great question, and, and we obviously have a huge focus on trying to close that gap in state, in the state of, across the state of California, and those gaps are large in California. Actually, we have some of the larger gaps of any state in the country if you look at some of the standard uh, tests. 
But in terms of the gifted programs, uh, I saw a story last night on, on 60 Minutes. Did any of you see that story or on Sunday night uh, about the student uh, Jack and Andraka who won the Intel Science Fair last year? Absolutely amazing story. 15-year-old middle school student who um, was so inspired to find uh, a test for pancreatic cancer that he went out and did it on his own as a middle school student and actually came up with a working prototype. None of the major labs could do this with their huge teams, but it was his uh, project and he was in the, in the formal classroom and his teacher actually, at one point he said in the interview, scolded him and asked him what he was doing during class time right. <laughs> because he was so far ahead. But I think he, he really referenced uh, after school and summer programs. And competitions uh, like that. And competitions Science like that great. that really helped push him forward and being able to connect with university faculty. He sent letters off to, I think, uh, like a hundred. is another great. Uh, right. Yeah. He sent off letters all, all over the country to find, try to find a mentor who would mentor him in that field. I don't mean to cut you off. We just got to move a little faster. Tim, coming over to you. We, you, you heard about the McAuliffe School and you know, these STEM schools. What's preventing more of those schools from happening? I know you're partnering with a couple of schools as well, but why aren't they ubiquitous? You know, I think people really do fear failure. And so they figure if they make that big of a change, they might fail. I would say that we have seen some incredible examples. Uh, we're partnering with some elementary schools that are just dynamite and they're not wealthy. They're in very poor communities. So it can be done. I think it boils down to some courageous leadership. It boils down to people who have courageous leadership with their parents uh, as well as their students. Um, as long as I have the stage, I want to make just a really quick uh, shout out to someone here who will be your resource in answering some of these questions. We have a new vice president of education, Liz Sylvan, if you could raise your hand. We do want to be your resource for answering questions like this. We want to help uh, be work, work, work with you to take courageous steps. And Liz comes to us from the MIT Media Lab, so it's very strong. Sorry, um, I just want to move real quick. Chris, um, um, real quick, cl closing thoughts. We've got, we've got a minute left. Actually, let me start from the end and we'll work our way down. Uh, closing thoughts, and also, how do we make kids more tinkerers? All that in 30 seconds. <laughs> I think, you know, we have to uh, encourage them to try new things and basically make uh, failures as not something that bad. I mean, that really is part of it, that the only way that you can learn new approaches is to try new things, things that has not been done before. And, uh, and uh, rather than getting ourselves fixated on grades and individual, uh, uh, that uh, we should concentrate more on the learning rather than specific grades. Thank you. Chris? Oh, wow. Closing thoughts. I think uh, I was here a year ago for your first summit, and I'm just, just uh, awestruck by the progress we've made as a state in one year and the opportunities that we have in front of us. Uh, it, it's an unbelievable time. Uh, I heard uh, from one superintendent recently say coming back to school in August was like Christmas for them. Uh, he, he's so optimistic about where we're headed uh, and, and the opportunities that we have in front of us to really remake our education system and put the right uh, emphasis in the right places going forward. So I'm just very happy to be here and a resource uh, to the incredible work that's going on here and across the state. Great. And Wendy, uh, yeah. would you, no, go, please, please. All right, final word is help kids get creative confidence to solve a big problem. Thank you. Mine is if you want them to be tinkerers, just let them be. Great. Please join me in congratulating this great panel. They'll be available. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel, and thank you for thank you, Mohammed, for that very fascinating conversation. Um, I'm proud to be a member of the um, um, the board at the Tech, and I just want to acknowledge the vision that Tim has brought there. And afterwards, we do have Elizabeth. He mentioned Elizabeth Silver, and I don't know where she was, but she will be having a lightning round, and you could find out some of the exciting things that are going on there. And if you're not familiar with the Tech Challenge, I encourage you to um, to become familiar with it. I do want to acknowledge and thank. Two of our other sponsors, J.P. Morgan Chase and Southwest Airlines. And I also want to thank my colleagues at the foundation. Um, they're floating around here. Uh, Catherine Hamby, Bob Nichols, Rosemary Kamai, Jennifer Lee, uh, Michelle Rochelle, uh, Anna Schussler. And who did I leave out? I think I got everyone. Mike Welch, um, who's here. I see them in the back. And I also want to acknowledge my former colleague, Amy Wong, um, so reluctantly. Uh, she is now with the uh, Cupertino School District. Uh, Wendy mentioned her. Um, she's now helping them move ahead in the, uh, 
um, in integrating STEM in Cupertino, and also my colleague Fanny Chu, who I just noticed here, who helped out with this as well. Um, we are very, very fortunate as we move on to our next speaker to have someone um, who has set the agenda um, on STEM. Well, when you get to be superintendent, you don't have a lot of direct power, but what you get to do is help set the agenda. And our um, state superintendent of public instruction has made STEM a primary focus. In fact, November 17th and 18th, uh, November, excuse me, November 17th and 18th, there will be a STEM summit in Sacramento. And um, I also think this is probably one of the most exciting times if you're going to be state superintendent as you move towards um, uh, the, the education system moves to implementation of Common Core and implementation of Next Generation Science Standards. And Tom has really been a leader on this. In fact, the other day I was watching um, NBC Education Nation, Nation. They had Randy Weingarten on. I don't know if you know who that is. She's uh, president of one of the major unions. And she made reference to Common Core implementation in New York as the New York debacle. She got me a little nervous, you know, when she mentioned that. And then in the next breath, mentioned California as a state who's implementing Common Core in the right way. Now, I was stunned, because I don't know the last time education and a compliment to national TV was ever given. And I was really kind of excited about hearing that. And, and, um, and I think our state superintendent needs to get some credit for that. And I think he's really leading the state and moving us along in a way that it will, the Common Core uh, will be very doable, will be prepared. So please welcome our state superintendent of public instruction, Tom Torlakson. Good afternoon. It's a great afternoon, right? And are you revved up and ready? This is a great symposium, a great forum. Thank you, Manny. Manny Mohammed told me, you know, the energy. I was here last year, but he said the energy was building. So I did my run, got my endorphins kicked in, had three and a half cups of coffee so far, so the caffeine kicked in. So I'm going to try to stay up with you. But are we excited? That's the word of the day, I guess. That's the word of the day. And just in terms of how we are as professionals, who we are, uh, as we work in education arena, as we work in our business world. It's just a fa fascinating, fascinating time. I call it a time of excitement, anticipation, and optimism. And just think where we were one year ago. Uh, we were pins and needles just worried were we going to have another $6 billion of cuts. So what a difference a year makes, what a difference an election makes, uh, huge changes out there. Uh, Prop 30, we're still pretty happy about Prop 30, $7 billion more a year going into the state with the promise to invest it in education. Do we like that? Yeah. That was enormous. And I'll, I'll mention these in a quick, and come back to them, a quick uh, just reference. Common Core, we've been talking about it. Uh, but along with it, the belief in teachers, the belief in administrators to work together uh, to invest wisely and an historic dedication of funds to implement the Common Core, 1.25 billion. I led a group of educators from school board members to administrators to the PTA, the CTA, the CFT, all working together saying to the governor and the legislature, we need to invest in this transformative time and in this opportunity. And so 1.25 billion is available. We can talk some more about that. Uh, I, again, think we're leading the nation in terms of that kind of commitment, as Manny mentioned. Local control funding, very important new opportunity. We can talk more about that. There'll be some question and answer time afterwards. The local plans that districts must do can define the direction we go in STEM and in other areas. And CTE, career technical education, there are some exciting initiatives of very innovative outcomes of this year's budget and the debate in these areas. And last but not least, are we pretty happy the science standards got adopted? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, Gary, a number of people who worked on both the STEM task force and on the new science standards. Before going further, I want to sort of ground us a bit just by having you visualize two scenes. Uh, this is what gets me grounded all the time. First is thinking about students coming back to school. 
In the last several weeks, six and a quarter million students in California, over 10,000 schools and 1,100 districts came back to school with smiles, with hopes. And these students, for the most part, arrived back with their own high hopes and the hopes of their parents and their teachers, those high hopes and high expectations. So uh, we had the best opening of schools in five or seven years. Uh, I heard the same thing as Chris was mentioning. In fact, it was uh, Chris Steinhauser from Long Beach uh, talking to him. It was like Christmas in August and getting started with some resources. So a chance to build uh, less pink slips, more smiles, building rather than dismantling. And so besides this historic large-scale transformation that's taking place in California, and I think in a leading way across the country here in California, all the things that we have mentioned, I have added that personal excitement to being a grandfather, by being a grandfather for the second time. Now, uh, that was my daughter's doing, my oldest daughter's doing, but uh, I am so happy in terms of you know, seeing this new life. Eight weeks ago, Mateo Tomas uh, came into the world, and with my other grandson, who's three and a half, uh, I have fun. The word joy was mentioned by our panel on more than one occasion. I have joy in watching them. And what do we see in our children, in our nieces and nephews, and in our grandchildren? At the start of life, we see constant curiosity, endlessly inquisitive young minds, exploring, discovering, in essence, yearning for learning and thirsting for knowledge. And isn't that what we want to keep alive in our schools, in our education, all through, including STEM, which naturally fits with exploring the world and discovering? And so this is, this is what I see. And then you've had the chance, many of you, to visit schools. Uh, you see great things going on. You get inspired and pumped up. Up and down the state, I just finished a trip in Northern California, went to Shasta High School, visited a robotics class. Uh, the students were just very creatively working in teams. There were, you know, 10 visitors in the class. They hardly looked up. They were so engrossed and so in involved and happy. And the instructions didn't meet the pieces they had to build their robots. Uh, so they had to improvise. They had to engineer right on the spot, troubleshoot right on the spot. Two of those students, by the way, from that school in Shasta, California, in Reading, became the first two students in the United States to get certification for robot C language. And that was at Shasta High. In Chico High School, they have an incredible architecture and engineering program. Students working on CAD computer-aided drawing, reading plans, uh, working, uh, thrilled to have internships where they're working in real jobs and real projects. Uh, at businesses and in public works agencies and earning college credit. They will graduate from high school with 10 to 15 units of college credit in the engineering field under their belts. And up and down the state, construction academies. Have any of you visited a construction academy to see young people again getting floor plans and, and getting their hands on and, you know, applied learning? Lincoln High School in Stockton, Arcata in McKinleyville, Kearneyville, uh, Kearney High School in San Diego. Uh, they're building. The students are hands-on creating. They're building houses they sell on the market. They're building Habitat for, Humanity, Habitat for Humanity houses, but they're also building market rate housing up in uh, Humboldt County at Arcata McKinleyville Joint School Program. Savannah High School has a solar power uh, boat race and contest, and the students are innovatively designing their sleek craft that will go faster than others. And just one other reference, Hudson Middle School, uh, down in Long Beach, a uh, large uh, number of disadvantaged students, English learners. They have a Mesa club with about 45 students and five girls, uh, three Latinas, uh, two Filipinas, won not only the state competition, the regional and the state, but they went on and won the national competition. And so that here again are these bright young minds ready to go and ready to learn. Uh, there's a story I can tell later if we want on solar suitcases, how solar suitcases save lives at Elk Grove at Laguna High campus. So I could go on, you can tell. I'm inspired, I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm a science teacher too, so this is an extra level of excitement for me. First priority that I have for our Department of Education and our collective team of schools is to implement as smoothly as possible, as efficiently as possible, and as excitingly as possible the new Common Core Standards. So it's a new way of learning, as you know and you've been hearing, not a mile wide, an inch deep, but less content and deeper, more creative. And so I, I really want to thank the teachers of California and the administrators who believe in this and believe that it's, it is extra work and it's going to take extra training, but we're going to, we're going to do this lift together 
and it's going to be better for our kids, for their own self-confidence, their own future careers, and for our economy. So I just want to take this one second here, just, well, maybe more than one second. I'm also, you know, into physical education and all that. So uh, just, if you're a teacher, an educator, uh, just stand up. If you're in any way a school board member, teacher, educator, just stand up and let's recognize you. Let's thank all of you for that work that you do. Wow, we have a great, great team of educators here. Thank you very much for what you do day in and day out. Truly something uh, we're proud of and something that's making a difference in this state. Now I mentioned the 1.25 billion. It's targeted in three areas, so uh, you're aware of this, but you know, surprisingly, uh, we are not at the top of the nation in the use of technology in our schools. We're about 45th in the nation. And we may only have about one half the bandwidth and one half the internet, internet connecting devices that we need to get our students connected to the internet. So part of this 1.25 billion is for districts to be able to buy their, their antennas, their towers, their bandwidth, uh, to also buy internet connecting devices to make sure that we have students capable of taking the new computer-based assessments. So we're working hard at that and the money, I just sent out the first 600 million checks went out a couple of weeks ago. They're arriving at districts and they're spending the money right away on the technology. That's really big. Our technology plan, by the way, we're working uh, with the idea and goal of one-to-one -one computing capacity and we're, we're aiming at that. We call it no child left offline. <laughs> okay. Uh, that other thing, that other program we'll leave behind, but this one, this one is what we want for kids. 24-7 and close that digital divide and really make it happen. And by the way, we're going to be having a, a task force report coming out and thank many of you in this room, John and others who helped uh, on that report. It's coming out and it's recommending a number of things, including having a top level administrator in my department that will spearhead the implementation of the technology part of our new learning opportunities and work with those 10,000 schools across the state of California. The other place where the money's going to go is in, in teacher training and workforce preparation and the, the learning of how to deliver this new, new critical thinking, problem solving. Another piece of good news, uh, I was with the governor and Susan Bonilla, the assemblywoman who spearheaded the bill I was sponsoring. Uh, we were in his office and we had the chance for him to sign the bill, 484, some of you know what that is. But it, it, it was a clear break saying we're moving to the future. We're not going to get stuck doing these old tests, the old bubble tests on standards that were sunset three years ago. I said, let's take the 25 million that we would spend on these old tests, the old bubble tests, the CSTs, and put it into the opportunity for all 3.2 million students eligible in California to take the new assessment in the new Common Core. We're going to take that money and we ramped up from about 700,000 students to 3.2 million. They'll have the experience. Do you like that? We got rid of the old bubble test. The governor signed the bill. The third area, by the way, where that money can be invested is in the curricular materials we're going to need that are aligned to the standards. And by the way, I'm a teacher, so a science teacher, but also aware of finances. Uh, I ask you as a homework assignment to help us because we're going to need a very big team effort to go back to the legislature and ask for a double down uh, let's go double down on that 1.25 and get another round next year. Are you ready for that? We need help to get that done. So uh, this is transformative. These skills, you've heard the panel talk about it. And basically Common Core, it says let's integrate, let's not study math in the abstract and science in the abstract and civics. Let's integrate it all. Let's, let's make it relevant to the real world and engaging to students because it is real and it is integrated. Uh, so this is really a great opportunity and uh, Common Core, we're on our way. Now, Common Core is a big part and the new local control funding formula is a new part of this landscape that we're going to work in and lead in. But I want to know how many of you are aware of our STEM task force, the actual task force that we're, we pointed 55 members, several in this room who were instrumental, thank you again Chris Rowe and others, who helped us hammer out a blueprint for action for a renaissance in the in the uh, STEM fields. Uh, preview of the recommendations, the report's going to come out in the next few weeks. Uh, we have five recommendations I'll just share with you now. First, that in the early grades, students should be building the foundation for STEM learning by highlighting the value of problem solving and other 21st century skills. And by the way, I'm very big on the upcoming Hour of Code. Have you heard of this? That'll start with uh, six-year-olds six and seven-year-olds. The Hour of Code is code.org. Check it out. Many of the companies and pioneers in this valley, uh, in this area, in this region, uh, are partners with this effort. But it's going to be in December. 
There's going to be a national and international contest to get millions of students to do programming, to take the mystique out of computers and how they work and show students how they can do that from simple exercises that a six and seven year old can do up to more advanced apps that maybe our high school students would work on. So that's one is to really emphasize these problem solving skills and uh, science skills all the way through from the youngest age. Second, to instill a value for STEM fields and underrepresented groups, especially women. So the various organizations, there's Girls Who Code, there's a number of organizations that reach out to disadvantaged students and help them find their way to these exciting career pathways. Uh, three, consider promoting STEM instruction in teacher training programs to help candidates understand the value of including STEM instruction in broad-based integrated curriculum across the board, not just in the science classes. And then the professional development over the arc of a teacher's career to provide more funding, not just these one or two occasions where the state is dedicating some funding, but a, a larger framework for that. And then to create a searchable clearinghouse, a place where our great um, best practices and best models for partnerships, programs in STEM can be shared and best lesson plans. Uh, we have the Brokers of Expertise website attached uh, to my website. Uh, CDE website, and there's now going to be a national learning registry where lesson plans and, and cool ideas in STEM and all other subjects can be housed and easily accessed. So it, it is an exciting time. Um, the symposium was mentioned. Get ready for that. Code.org. The hour of coding is coming in December. And another big opportunity has been afforded by the legislature's vision and the governor's vision. I work very closely with Daryl Steinberg, the president of the Senate, on CTE, again, I think when we see these programs, career technical education, where you apply all of what we're talking about to career pathways, I find that students are so motivated, uh, they're excited, they have a purpose, they do their homework in the math, they study their language skills, they, they advance, they're not dropping out, they're not getting into trouble because they see a purpose, they have a dream of where they're going. So two things, we've had the, we've had the partnership academies, 500 of them in the state, which offer rich relationships between business and public entities. It might be a lab, the Lawrence Lab, it might be uh, hospitals, but students get to actually do internships and get real world experience in those job situations. And teachers get externships. They get the chance to get out of the classroom and go in the real world and experience these jobs firsthand and bring back a more informed and enthusiastic approach to their students. Well, the point I'm gonna make is that $250 million was allocated in this budget 10 times the amount of money we spend every year on these partnership academies, which are proven to work. And so we have an innovative opportunity to do a career pathways program in computer science, in, in all STEM fields, uh, we have a chance to really get some money out there. So my department has this opportunity to de develop the grant guidelines and we will be putting out the guidelines in December and then the actual grant applications uh, in January. So a lot is happening. I'm gonna conclude with this quote from a good friend of mine, a good friend of ours, Linda Darling Hammond. Most of you know her, works right nearby at Stanford. She was key in my transition team and she's been just a great friend, a great advisor. And so she says a key part of the new and expanded mission of schools is to quote, prepare students to work at jobs that do not yet exist, creating ideas and solutions for products and problems that have not yet been identified using technologies that have not yet been invented. So is that what we're all about? Are you revved up and ready? We can do this. This is a great time. Uh, look forward to your questions, but thank you for what you're doing already, and let's be a team to make it happen. Thank you very much. And the winner is, oh, these are cards with good questions, okay? Do you anticipate performance type assessments for the science standards? I think we're gonna get there eventually uh, in terms of adding that in. Uh, there, there's some end of course and other certificate driven ideas in terms of uh, defining competency. So I, I see this happening. It's a big lift just to switch and it was a battle by the way. We were threatened by US Department of Education to have our Title I monies taken away if we didn't do everything exactly the way uh, the US Department wanted it. But we said, no, we're gonna, do this, and so we just got the green light from the governor signing that bill to move forward all out to implement the Common Core and the new uh, computer-based adaptive assessments. So that's gonna be a heavy lift, and I anticipate we will go there after this to these other ki kinds of certificate and competency measures. 
Um, elementary teachers do not always have the strongest math backgrounds. How can we be sure they are prepared and that incoming teachers are prepared and bring current teachers up to speed? Part of it is what was mentioned is the professional development, uh, learning networks. Part of it is working through our STEM hubs uh, that, that Chris is helping create. It's, it's a challenge. The, the other thing is looking at specialists in districts. And this will be a choice. Some districts will know that their math scores are way below or their math scores for Latino or African American students are way lower than they should be. There's, a, there's an achievement gap. And they can target kinds of math instruction programs to help with that. And they can also bring in the math specialist or in the case of, a, say, the science side of it, uh, the wizard, the person who comes to campus, helps the elementary teacher who has maybe a background in history or English, but not a background in math and science, help that teacher get some really cool lessons they can do five or seven days before the, the expert arrives, and then they have lessons going off after the visit to uh, get the students even more excited and the teachers informed. So this is a great opportunity. Does. California face a teacher shortage, and yes, what credibility, what credentialing programs to address it? So it's been, right, it's been a pretty rugged five years of budgets. Pink slips, pink slips, pink slips. You know, come be a teacher, and then you get layoff notices three, four years in a row. It's been agonizing. We had about five years ago 77,000 teacher candidates in California. Last year we had about 35,000. This year we have about 27,000. It's plummeted. So we have a huge challenge, and I, I think some of the good news of what we're doing here at this conference uh, with the Silicon Valley uh, Education Foundation is doing, investing in schools, and thank you for that, uh, is going to help make a difference and make education more attractive again. And as a science teacher, you know, uh, pay was not my number one, you know, it was having science equipment, having field trip money, it was having stuff that I could do cool labs with my students with. So part of it is, is with the new local control funding formula, is investing in some of these areas uh, which can help uh, do exactly what was said in this question. Other questions or answers? Right on the top here. Okay. What resources are being allocated for toddler pre-K education? How important is this emphasis to you and your team? It is huge. I think even more transformative than the, the new local control funding formula will be universal preschool. We have to get there. We have to get there. We need our toddlers to have that rich learning experience early. And for the kids on the wrong side of the achievement gap that start, you know, a quarter of our kids in California grow up in poverty. One in five of our kids grow up without either parent having a high school diploma. And so they don't have books at home. They don't have a, hair, a fair start. Their vocabulary is limited. So if we have high quality child care and high quality preschool for toddlers, we'll see a transformation. So these students, instead of being a year and a half behind when they start kindergarten, and then further and further behind uh, their peers from other neighborhoods, uh, they'll have a fair start. And we need to find the way to do that. So a number of us are working and looking at future ballot measures. And it's a fight in the budget. So child care quality, in my division, in my department, we provided child care for about 500,000 students and preschool combined. Uh, we got it dropped down to about 350,000. So we lost 150,000 slots and we need to build it back. So we're fighting hard for that. We like the idea of universal preschool. It's really, really important. With the new state funding model, less money is going to LOEs? County offices. County offices of education. How will county offices of education dealing with alternative ed and other special programs, how they get a fare with less money? So again, this was an historic shift, the local control funding formula, many moving parts, many elements. Uh, for instance, the partnership, academies, the partnership academies I mentioned were protected. I fought for that. I wanted ROP to be protected because ROP is a great place where young people get skills and can go right out and get good jobs and support their families. Uh, the ROP is sort of up in the air. So some, some county offices, uh, the districts that they um, oversee and work with, are going to keep the money and the county offices won't get the money. So there's some real question up and down the state what will happen to ROP, for instance. So in, in terms of alternative ed programs, the same thing. Uh, we don't have the answer. My staff will work with any advocates here to look at ideas you have for addressing this. But I think we're going to need some cleanup legislation as we move forward to, to look at a few places where 
things came out uneven. Okay, here's another one. Do you see, have you seen corporate volunteers helping with STEM learning? This is so important. More interest, engagement oriented, yes. Yes, and so uh, this is so important. Well, this is whole uh, hour of code contest is a, is a partnership between probably 25 or 30 of the top tech companies in the nation and in California and the top entrepreneurs uh, who are investing in it. Uh, other examples are, for instance, Mesa Mass Engineering Science Achievement has programs. They have a, a, a mentoring program with Cisco where employees adopt a student and tr track with that student all year long, visit with that student, uh, tell them about their work, take them to their workplace, uh, do things after hours with them to you know, engage them and get them to be, believe in themselves and to have self-confidence. That's one example. They have a job shadowing day at Google. So there's many ways that businesses can help. And if you want more involvement as a business, uh, please co connect with us, uh, connect with me afterwards, and we'll really look for those opportunities. We need more help, though. This is heavy lifting. This transformation is, is a heavy lift, and we need you know, help from everything to how to get the elementary kids' uh, education in STEM more excited, more rich. Uh, you can help with that. Businesses can help with that. Let me try this one. I can read it better. Can you speak to what the state is doing to connect STEM with environmental education efforts? Yes. Uh, in my upcoming uh, report in the, the work product from, again, Chris and Mohammed and others who helped with the STEM report, we reference environmental education. It's a subset, obviously, of, of STEM education. It's very important. And it, and it also gets to a place where you can begin to integrate civics and politics and government and geography uh, with science and with uh, global warming. Just one example, uh, you can learn the parts per million or different ingredients, uh, what's happening, uh, different theories about the Earth's warming. Is it cyclical? Is it man-made? What are the politics? So you can bring all this together. Uh, we have an environmental education curriculum that I worked on when I was in the Senate in the legislature and Fran Pavley uh, helped author legislation. So we have this curriculum and we're about to put a task force together to we're approaching philanthropy to help fund a task force effort to how do we spread this environmental curriculum out and train teachers in being able to use it. But the curriculum now exists. It's taken about four years to develop it, and we want to use it. What do we got? You guys are full of questions today. What will the accountability for schools be like in the future? Will we still have program improvement? How will you measure the SBAC assessments? So. Yes, we're going to have accountability. We need accountability, and we're going to need data to sort of show progress and show uh, places where our instruction is weak or our program isn't strong enough. So we need to do that. Um, part of the accountability for the future, there's there's district school board accountability, and then there's you know measuring students' achievement and their progress, and how are we accountable for that? In the in the district side, is something that each of us will need to be involved, and across the state, citizens, business parents need to be involved at the local school board level because part of the shift of money, which is about $2 billion now per year, going to help disadvantaged students and English learner students, that will grow to $6, 7000000000 billion a year in the future. Districts are going to be required to have a plan for how they will target that money to programs that will make a difference with those students, how they will close the achievement gap, how they will get more girls involved in science classes. Whatever, the, they have a choice of how they define their local action plan. That's where the local control comes in. But with that comes a responsibility for us to be vigilant, to be watchful, and for the districts to be transparent and inviting and open to including the public in that process. So that's a big measure of the accountability coming up. Uh, we have a, you know, you, Manny mentioned the New York problem. We're going to be having a major shift. In, Today, you're the most informed audience probably um, anywhere in California in terms of what Common Core and what the new SBAC assessments will be like. Uh, it's, it's a huge lift, and there's a disconnect between the old system, you know, and the API, uh, and the API itself is changing. Uh, so it's like apples and bananas. Uh, the new system, we're going to need to benchmark it, and we're going to need to explain to parents and businesses why it's important, and employers very much like the skill set that we're talking about, why it's important and, and why it's something we should embrace. So um, stay tuned. That's a big shift. It's something 
we're, we're looking forward to and we'll need some patience because we're not going to get the Common Core done like this in one year. This is going to take, you know, it's a three to five year process, maybe longer, but I, I believe the bulk of our 330,000 teachers and the professional development we're providing and the uh, creativity that they're using to embrace this new way of learning, this will turn the tide in the right direction over time. Okay, here we go. Will there be any STEM programs for parents? They are an important part of the child's education, obviously. Very, very important. Um, part of it is, again, getting back to these school board decisions about how they're going to use their extra funding. I think it's key to get parents involved. I know as a teacher myself, um, you know, I was back in the early 70s promoting recycling, which was considered radical back then, but uh, the students, would, we'd get wallpaper and take cardboard boxes and make colorful little boxes and recycle all the paper in the school. But then I had the students go home and teach their parents that you know, every time you throw away aluminum can, it's like even a light switch on for five hours, you waste that much energy rather than recycling it. And so these uh, students can be our missionaries for you know, watching energy consumption, uh, good buying habits. I mean, part of the value of STEM is what Linda Darling Hammond said, but it's also to have informed citizens and to have informed consumers. Uh, we want students to go and we want more engineers and want more students to go in the STEM fields, but we want every student to be thoughtful and be under, you know, knowledgeable about choices. And so I think that's where it's important and our young people can be ambassadors and, our, and teachers to their parents as part of the solution. You guys have been wonderful. Thank you very much for what you do. The team effort is there. We're going to get there. They're revved up and ready, Manny. Thank you. You know, I was superintendent for 10 and a half years before I retired, and it's refreshing that the focus has been on curriculum and instruction instead of where we're going to be making cuts and all the other uh, topics that for so many years preoccupied education. So, Tom, thank you so much for your leadership and for being here today. Very much appreciated. <clears throat> Okay, let's see where we're going here. Can I get this to switch or do we have to? So I introduced my next panel. Can we get this going? Or do I need to? Okay, well let me do this while we're getting that set up. And um, when I acknowledge my colleagues at the foundation, I failed to mention Connie Skipatoris, who I just saw back there. So I want to make sure that I thank her as well, because this is a major team ever to put on um, uh, this event. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask the um, next panel to please uh, come on up, and I will introduce you as you are on your way again. Remind you that if you have questions, uh, Bob will have the... Um, the cards that you can ask of this panel. So, let me get this in here. Let me make sure I get the titles. <clears throat> okay, here we go. So, um, let me um, let me introduce um, our next. Um, panelists and uh, say a little bit. First of all, um, <clears throat> Mariana, uh, so, so far you've had some kind of like some policy, statewide, kind of large scale thinking. Now we're going to talk to people who are doing the work and doing it uh, well, experimenting and moving forward. Um, first I want to introduce uh, Mariana Garcia who is uh, a teacher in the Adventure STEM program from my former district in Oak Grove. And um, I've seen this is a program that is, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, but focusing at STEM at grades four through eight. And um, so you're going to, this is a teacher who's doing the work. And so thank you, Mariana, for being here today. Um, I want to introduce Leo Johnson from Independence High School. I want to tell you very quickly how I met Leo and how we got here today. So we were at a um, function at the county. And um, we had some information about he said, and he comes up and he holds one of our documents and he said, you're focusing too much on the math and the science and you're leaving out the technology and the engineering. I said, well, who are you? 
<laughs> and um, so he introduced himself, and uh, he's a teacher at Independence High School teaching science and engineering. He invited me to visit his class, which I did. Did absolutely um, great experience, does a terrific job. And so when this came up, I wanted to ask him to share, um, uh, to be part of this panel, and also afterwards uh, to, be, to be part of our lightning round. So Leo, thank you very much for, for being here and giving the high school teacher perspective. Uh, we have with us uh, Julian Martinez, who's Director of Resources Development and Marketing uh, from uh, MESA. The terrific job um, in this area, math, engineering, and science. And I want to thank you for being here and, um, and being part of our panel. Um, the last two are um, former colleagues of mine. And I want to um, uh, acknowledge Chris Funk, who is the uh, superintendent in the Eastside Union High School District. Uh, many years ago, John Porter and I tried to get the, uh, the districts in the Eastside to collaborate and uh, create and to work together. We couldn't quite get it going in a large purpose. Is, and um, recently, with Chris's leadership in Eastside, we've been able to bring the districts together in the Eastside Alliance and could not have happened without Chris's uh, leadership on that. So I want to acknowledge um, Chris on that. And finally, my former colleague, John Porter, who has um, uh, been a leader, in not only among the superintendents, but also in the area of STEM. Uh, most recently, as a partnership with the tech, um, Tim was alluding to it, um, starting Kennedy and Lerone um, STEM schools. And so we're very fortunate. Thank you, John, for, for being here today. And our um, moderator is an editorial, excuse me, a Mercury News writer who many of you know or should know, Mike Cassidy. And again, we did not plan it this way, but if you read Mike's article uh, this morning on what's happening with this, this leadership group, um, corporate leaders trying to get computer science in all of, the, uh, all of the schools. So Mike, thank you so much for being with us here today. So at this point, please welcome Mike and the rest of the panel. Lots of resources here. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Manny. Um, it sure seems like you have a lot of former colleagues. I, <laughs> is that, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, uh, but anyway, it's, it's really good to be here. It's very reassuring. You know, you can, uh, you can shut down the U.S. government, you can shut down BART, you can shut down AC Transit, but you can't seem to shut down uh, the Silicon Valley Education Foundation's obsession with STEM. So uh, I kid because I love, you know. Uh, obviously, it's a very serious issue, and we've got a, a really good panel here to talk about it. So rather than prattle on and on, um, we'll start talking about it. I actually know some of you guys, so uh, good to see you again. And I, I thought I would just start by, uh, you know, we've been talking today about integrating STEM, um, and I was wondering if maybe each of you could very briefly uh, talk about your role in that and, you know, the, sort of the question, why are we here in, individually? And I, I suppose you could just start, you know, be boring and just go in order. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so let me start by saying I think STEM education and the Common Core go hand in hand because I can really define them both the same way and that is interdisciplinary team teaching around project-based learning infused with technology to help students and teachers solve problems and assess the learning that takes place. So to me, it's a, just a natural fit, and this is a pivotal time in education to really focus on how teachers teach and how students learn and how we assess students. And so project-based learning, problem-based learning infused with technology is just the natural place to go. Uh, in Eastside, we have several schools that have various STEM programs, academies that are in place, computer science classes, um, different uh, academies that uh, are integrated and working with our middle schools to uh, have that pathway for our students. And so I think you'll see actually more examples of STEM here locally uh, than you can actually um, imagine. And in the next uh, three to five years, I think you're just going to see that uh, quadruple uh, as we move forward with the implementation of Common Core uh, with the integration of STEM. 
Good afternoon. Um, so I'm from MESA, the Math, Engineering, Science Achievement uh, Program Network. And we like to say we're California STEM solution. Uh, we've been at it since 1970. So back then we were discussing SME. This was before STEM. So science, math, engineering, education. So now we're at STEM. Uh, we're really excited that STEM is everywhere. Uh, you know, we've pioneered a lot of the inquiry-based learning. It's been in our DNA from the get-go. Uh, we have the pathway uh, from sixth grade all the way to graduate school, if a student chooses to be. Uh, we're in middle schools, high schools, undergraduate schools, community colleges. We have the whole pipeline all the way through. Uh, it still leaks. Uh, we're working on that very hard and diligently. We are partnered with industry. Uh, we partner, I know our students come in and use the tech museum. Uh, so we kind of avail ourselves to all the resources and we partner with all schools. Uh, one of our major focuses now is how do we get computer science into the schools as early as middle school. So I'll stop there. All right, I first started by leaving industry and taking a $25,000 pay cut 30 years ago and I'm pleased to have gone to Eastside, Overfeld High School and start as Mr. Torkelson said, one of our partnership academies, the Electronics Academy there. I worked there for about 12 years, meeting daily with the entire teacher team. So when you talk about integrating uh, curriculum, that's what we did daily, planning it out throughout the entire year and individually identifying those students to make sure that they all succeeded. Then I also have moved over to Independence High School and working there in the, what was a magnet program, Space Tech uh, Magnet, and also working with the Electronics Academy there. To integrate better, we merged those two programs, and now we uh, use the acronym STEAM, Space Tech Engineering Academy Magnet. And that has been, we are now the biggest program, as far as I'm aware of, in Eastside, and we are constantly meeting with the teachers. We have a common prep. That's very important that the scheduling administrator make sure that we have a common prep and that we can meet to continue to do that integration and individualize the instruction for the students. Thank you. So this, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm from Adventure. We are a, the opposite in the sense that we are a very small program. We, we have 140 students. We've been doing STEM since we started four years ago. And as, they were, as my fellow panelists were saying, we talk about integration. That is one of the key things that we have. And when, uh, when we got this year, or, well, when we started with the whole, oh, Common Core is coming, Common Core is coming, we've been, we, our team has been like, well, we've been actually doing Common Core for four years. The, really, the shift for us has not been great, has not been even nothing, because we've been doing it. This is exactly the type of performance stacks that we've been asking the students to do. We, just a small correction, it's five through eight that we, that we serve. And the students are thriving, the students are engaged, the students are working on the computers all the time. I teach the science component and it's amazing what, what we have them do. They are coding, they are, um, they are solving problems. We've had several really successful integrated units. Sometimes they're not as successful because we do sometimes not it's not well thought out, but with it, with our common prep and with all of these little successes that we've, been, that we've had in working with our administrators that have been very good at giving us the leeway to do anything, basically anything that we wanted to do. And we've been kind of like, we've become a little bit of the model for the rest of the school district in how to do this, how to implement Common Core and how to work with all of these students. Well, I'd like to uh, piggyback on several of my colleagues up here. Um, I think the, the real gift to us has been the Common Core Standards. Uh, we field tested the standards last year in three grade levels. We actually had students keep talking about the questions up to two weeks after they took the test. I have never seen that giving the, the old California State test. The, when the students were done, they were done. But to have kids, because they had to answer complete thoughts, they had to write out their answers, the excitement in it was really outstanding. What we've done is we've taken t um, two of our low-performing, challenging schools, 
And we piloted one with Kennedy uh, School with the Tech Museum. If, is anybody here from the Tech? I'd like to, there, I'm sorry, Tim, I didn't see you, but it has just been transformational. Uh, we took everything the Tech had to offer and we integrated in with the school. And I, if I can talk, I won't go into the details, but the outcomes were outstanding. In one year, the school became an 800 API school. It, science scores were one of the highest in the county. It's never done that before. Academic language, everything the students, the students, as one parent told me, lived and breathed science every day. And that paid off into other, their other subject areas. We're doing the same thing in another end of the school district with uh, two of our other schools that uh, are learning from the Kennedy School experience. And then once we have those schools really embedded in the STEM, then we're going to figure out how to go district-wide. Thanks. Um, you know, I don't want to bring up a lot of bad memories, but for those of you who have launched these programs, who have uh, helped start them, um, Mariana, Leo, and John, and if I'm missing somebody, can you talk about the challenges you had when you, when you started to get these things off the ground or tried to? Well. I can, I can speak to, to our experience. There's been several, first of all, is convincing the, hiring the right people. Doing what we do requires a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And being able to, hire, to have the strong teachers and the strong, and the strong administrators that are able to say to everyone else, well, they are doing something different and this is something that is, that is going to be, that is going to be really, different and giving us the, the permission to actually do it. Uh, it takes a lot of extra prep, extra time, extra, that things that, don't, that people don't necessarily understand that, well, if I'm going to be creating an integrated unit that based on something that I watched on the news just yesterday, it's, you know, you, you, we need the time to actually sit down and do this and we need the willingness of all of the people involved to do this. The other thing that, happen, that has happened to us is also, attracting the, attracting the right students. We tend to be, to be viewed as the GATE program. And we are not the GATE program, but we attract a lot of parents that are expecting us to accelerate students in math. And although we do accelerate students in math, it is just one of those that it's like, well, do not, do not come to us and expect your children to leave our program being geometry, doing geometry, but at the, but, I mean, we don't want the kids that are already at, at that level. We want the kids that have struggles and that need that extra push and that extra broadening of the horizons to see where it is applied. Those students that are like, when am I ever going to use this? Well, this is when you use it. And those, we have a lot of misconceptions about what STEM is and what we do, as opposed to, well, this is just problem-based, project-based learning that we're doing. This is not, oh, we are teaching, uh, college level curriculum. Sometimes we are, but mm -hmm. the reality, yeah, sometimes we do. It's like, I, I have a lot of students that come back to us and it's like, well, you know, I never saw that until, I mean, I didn't see that in my first year in high school or in my second or third, and right now I'm seeing it. It's like, well, yeah, we've been doing that, but you were, you were able to do it, right? So that is, that is most, our biggest thing, so for me. You know, a couple of things jump out that uh, obviously it's important to hire the right teachers. It's too bad you don't get to hire your administrators, right? Yeah, we've and, been and very lucky. I do have to say that we have been very, very lucky. We have a very supportive administration. And I guess, in, of course. And in the same vein, you can <laughs> pick the... Uh, you can pick the students, but it's a little hard to pick their parents, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I do have to say, Manny hired me, so yeah, we have very, very good administrators. So you're a former <laughs> colleague of his, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so anyone else who started a program, do you, do you have some uh, Well, I can reinforce the team concept. It's, it is the dynamic of the teacher team, and that's what I found at Overfelt. It, it was a fabulous experience. Then I, about eight years ago, I went to Independence with their Space Tech Magnet, and they also had an electronics, another electronics academy there. The East Side actually had three of them. And uh, two years later, uh, the electronics teacher and myself received an email from the school that said, you need to find a new job, your programs have been shut down. So what immediately happened was the district office said, no, you can't do that. We already have Perkins funds for next year, so you can't do that. Then we got, as what's everybody stating here, 
a new set of administrators because one was retiring, somebody else was rolling out, and we've had them consistently for the last few years, for the entire six years, and they have been absolutely fabulous and just won a six on their WASC, always supportive, and uh, we got the backing to go ahead with, and one reason I'm up here is to go with Project Lead the Way because the school board did vote to go A to G. That meant we could do something that nobody had ever done before, and that was implement four Project Lead the Way classes at A to G level in our school at one time. But, and in the lightning rounds, you're gonna have somebody from Chevron there. We had a Chevron uh, grant to kick that off. So as you talk about administration, uh, teacher teams, the district supporting it, you need other funding supporting it. Uh, it's just been fabulous ever since that moment. We've just been expanding and taking off. It's been great. Sure. I, I just want to add, so Mesa, 66 Mesa centers throughout the state serving 30,000 students and, you know, hundreds of school districts. So they're talking singularly, you know, multiply that by a couple of hundred, the bureaucracy, getting agreements, memorandum understanding, resources, commitments, uh, you know, uh, big challenge. Also getting uh, everyone doing the MESA model correctly, or not correctly, but the same or similarly, because everyone starts out at a different base. Uh, and I just also want to mention that we are also part of MESA USA. We spawn this program now. It's in nine other states. So you start adding the complexity mm -hmm. of all of these things, and it starts uh, magnifying. Uh, and then trying to keep it all together. So I'm part of the state, what we call the statewide office, and so we're responsible for uh, one of the things that we forget. We're so busy and we're so enamored and so, having so much fun and joy helping the students, working with them, classrooms full of fun. Uh, who's tracking the data, you know? And that's the outcomes. Uh, that's something that I would just advise anyone, start with the end in mind and work your way back. Uh, because in the end, and I, I know the Chevron grant <laughs> uh, folks very well, uh, you know, that's what they're demanding and they uh, ask, uh, you know, what are the outcomes? How are you proving this? How are you improving proficiency across grade levels, uh, you know, from middle school to high school, high school to college? Uh, I would just, I'm sorry, but I would just like to add just uh, when, when he spoke about the funding, one of the things that, uh, that usually does not necessarily get addressed is that you do get the funding for to start but you but most people don't realize that it is the funding afterwards we got a lot of we got a lot of tech support in the beginning and then we discovered that we did not have bandwidth and then we we got that but then it's year 4 our machines are starting to, I mean, these machines were not made to be handled by 140 hands, six hours a day. Okay. And so, well, you, they start to break down. And, oh, but there's no funding for that. Oh, we didn't necessarily think that through. So just, sorry, mm -hmm. but that's another issue. I don't think we can do this by ourselves. Um, the standards aren't enough. Uh, if we didn't have the Tech Museum, Chevron Energy Solutions, our new partner, United States Coast Guard, um, San Jose State University, if we didn't have those partners working in depth with our schools, and not just the surface stuff, uh, we did that in the 70s when I first got into project-based learning. We would open up the yellow page and try to find a partner, uh, or we would try to make believe things, and the kids knew that we weren't really it wasn't really real what they were doing. You know, it was all simulation. With the Tech Museum, with Chevron, it's real stuff. The kids get to work on real things. And it's changing, um, it's changing the culture of the teachers and, and what they do. Even though, even many of them are liberal arts majors. They're like my daughter who went to college to take as little math as possible <laughs> in the school she picked, and I'm serious, and, the, and became a teacher. and had maybe a semester or one year at math at the, be at the most. Well, you teach these math standards in context, and they really take it seriously. And they understand. It's not just the student that's going through a learning curve, it's the teacher's going through a curve. And it's been very powerful in, in our district. Chris, did you have something you were tr no, trying I, to I, I was going to highlight that you have to have that end game in mind and know what the outcome is and, and 
backward map that and then identify what your non-negotiables are and if it's around the master schedule having coming prep period mm -hmm. uh, if it's um, around what that budget looks like when the grant falls out you have to identify what those are and then make sure you stick to it you know coming around to, to what you were just talking about um, the, what you know when you well most people in this room know better than I but when you look at the school day it looks like pouring 40 pounds of sugar into a 20 pound bag you know and uh, you've got disruptions and then just things you have to cover, things you have to get to. How, how do you go about integrating, you know, from looking on the outside, how, how do you go about integrating STEM, integrating these subjects into the curriculum? So let me just start by saying that uh, educators traditionally do not change, or si educational systems don't change very quickly, as you can imagine, since we still, in probably about 90% of our schools, uh, kids attend six periods a day for 55 minutes. Right. And so when you have that square box uh, and you're adding more to that, uh, you're not giving teachers the opportunity to plan because teachers are going to have, with the Common Core and with STEM, they're going to have to be given the opportunity to be creative again. We've taken the art of teaching away from teachers because of No Child Left Behind, yeah. because of the test prep. And so one, you have to give permission for teachers to be creative. Uh, and then two, you're, we're going to have to change and train the way students are used to being assessed. And we're going to have to train uh, our parents, our communities around how students are going to have to be assessed now. Because the outcome is going to change. And I have a prediction where some schools that may be more affluent or successful with our CSTs, they may not be as successful in the first couple rounds of the new Smart Balance testing. Not because the kids aren't capable and mm -hmm. not smart enough, they just haven't been trained in that appropriate assessment. Um, so I think it's critical that we actually redefine what the school day looks like. I think we redefine the concept. Does a student have to see a teacher every single day yeah. uh, to be effective to learn the material? Uh, does a student have to be in six periods uh, for the semester or the year, or could an internship count towards graduation credit? Could we have seminar classes that are simply pass-fail that actually allows the kids the opportunity to kind of test what they might be interested in, particularly uh, when you look at females in, in STEM and kids of color that traditionally do not excel mm -hmm. in the STEM class. So I think we just have to really change the institution upside down and redefine what that day looks like. Hmm. And piggybacking that on that, we have been, again, very fortunate in, the admi in our administration because, yes, we discovered that, for example, for me, for the science component, I need block schedule. But that doesn't necessarily work for math because then what happens with math is that they end up coming from a three-day weekend every other day. And mm -hmm. that, at some time, that sometimes I might need to see, the, to see a whole class of students for the whole day well, our social studies teacher might not necessarily need to see them for the, for the whole day, but if I want them to be successful in their language arts component of the, of the science project that they're, that they're turning into me, well, the, my, the, the language arts teacher might see them for three periods. So it, is very, it, is, it ends up being like very fluid. We also need to, re to remember, to give, we also have done that we give the students maybe a full work day where it's like you know you know where, what you need to accomplish and you know where you need to go and you know, need to, to see whatever teacher but we need to have also the confidence in the students that they're able to do that and they are and you'd be surprised I mean I had I when we've done that I've had that I've had students that I never thought would come to see me because they don't necessarily enjoy being being with me come and see me while others that I was like oh I was expecting I was expecting this student to come in they were like no they spend the, they spend the whole day in language arts because that's where they knew that they needed the help in order to complete the project so it is that flexibility it is that thinking outside the box we don't we we tend to forget that when you go outside into the world and you're actually working at those at those jobs you're not going to sit there and you're going to be like okay so i need i need to do the statistics portion for 49 minutes and then i get to go and do something else for for the rest of the 49 minutes so what, but what it takes is for the teachers to, to be able to integrate that and to be able to talk to each other during those common prep periods so, so that we all understand exactly what it is that the expectation is for the students. I'm not just trying to brown nose because Mr. Funk is my superintendent, <laughs> but uh, I can testify that he has backed up his words, that uh, there are 
the, the math departments meet together district-wide and make these plans. Uh, he has come to the schools and collect, collated information from the teachers. So he's not just a man of word, he's a man of action. The other integrating step is I am the MESA advisor at my school. <laughs> And that kind of aspect and, and collection for the students gives them a more connectivity to what the instruction is. It's almost following Common Core before they even thought about it. I went to the Tech Museum last week with my students as a field trip. Um, all these outreach things brings the whole concept together. However, most of my students couldn't go because the teacher said, you're going to miss something in my class. So if I have AP, advanced placement students, in my class, they're terrified of missing the material for the day. They can't do STEM connective activities away from the classroom. So that's just an aspect on the entire staff we need to think about. Yeah, we, we, the, the issue of time that Chris brought up is, is really uh, <coughs> critical. Uh, we had to reorganize the whole elementary school uh, we take class, uh, the tech museum, for example, comes to the school with their one-day labs. We take either a grade level or the whole school to the tech museum with the staff. You have to change everything. The interesting thing was that we saw an increase in student achievement across the board with the focus. Our big fear, and we, did, we were treading new waters. Uh, the faculty was nervous. They were excited to see how motivated the students were because our theme last year at Kennedy School and now our other STEM schools, learning happens within children, not at them. And so you never know when that light bulb takes off. And for the kids at Kennedy School, it took off in almost less than a year. So time is going to be the issue, but I've never had, we haven't had one grievance. We haven't had one major meeting with the Teachers Association that, by the way, you're Teachers at Kennedy are working um, beyond the contract day because the teachers saw the results, saw how excited the kids were. You know, John, you, you touched on something that, uh, that I was wondering about. To, to hear about the art of teaching is very inspiring and the idea of creativity is exciting. Uh, and here we are in Sil Silicon Valley, right, where everyone says it's okay to fail. Uh, there may be some venture capitalists and stockholders who disagree with that, but, <laughs> but I mean, how does that go over? To me, that's what would scare me to death, is that there seems to be instant analysis of everything schools do, be it, you know, administrations of schools or even in my kid's classroom. I've immediately decided, well, that didn't work, you know, whose boneheaded idea was that? Um, how, does that how does that factor into trying to be creative? Well, for us, it was interesting to have uh, partners with the Tech Museum and some of our corporate partners, the other partner was Del Wise, I, I forgot to mention, telling students that it's okay to fail and telling our teachers we tried things before that didn't work. So building in that scientific method of research and inquiry and that sometimes what you plan to do all, out of your best efforts. And the Tech Challenge is a great example. Our students didn't win the Tech Challenge, but they came in at different levels those kids loved it, every minute of it. And so I think that culture was helped by dealing with science in that context. And what about, say, parents or political pressures? What about that sort of, you know, the, the kids can be great because, you know, they, they can learn from when things don't work out, they learn. And so do adults, but the, uh, you know, people paying taxes or sending their kids to school or whatever, they're always not all that understanding. And I'm just curious how you, how you navigate that. Well, my shade of silver hair was a little bit more <laughs> like uh, Chris's at the time that I've we I've just decided started. to get rid of all mine. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the hairspray, <laughs> telling my kids. But, um, you know, the Tech Museum, had all of our families each year go for a whole th uh, night. They feed them and they let them go through the, the whole museum. Our families are ec ecstatic. I mean, and I'm not saying it, it, you can't do that with other partners, but it's a whole different situation when kids see the real stuff at a corporation or real simulations come with real people that do things with teachers. Teachers cannot be 
the, uh, the, uh, the project-based experts to make the Common Core standards alive. That's why mm -hmm. we need to have partners. And I think our, my biggest frustration in Silicon Valley is not being able to have a structure or organization that I can go to like I saw overseas in the Scandinavian countries in the United Kingdom where you go to one place as a school superintendent or director and you end up working with an entity that connects businesses to schools in a meaningful way like we just are all talking about. It's so fractured and scattered in the United States and I think that would be a wonderful gift to Silicon Valley if we could, we can't do it in the whole state, but we should be able to do it here. Mm -hmm. I'd also add that uh, you know, John and I, as superintendents, we are responsible to our board of trustees, and I think it's critical that you bring your trustees along the, through, with the process from the very beginning. Uh, I have my board president, Frank Beal, here, and when we went through the process around our strategic planning that we're hopefully finishing up in the next month or two, uh, it's been critical to uh, use them to, as a sounding board, have them be part of the discussion out in the community. Uh, one thing that we don't do very well in public education, particularly in East Side, is market our schools mm -hmm. as well as mm -hmm. tell the story. Uh, now, my whole background's been in athletics. So in competition, when you go to the game, you always have a winner and loser, mm -hmm. but if you only look at it that way and not what it took to actually get to the game and then perform to determine what the outcome is, you have to give people permission to fail. Uh, and so where you look at successful principles are not the principles that are simply black and white. They follow the checklist and say, I got off my plate. It's the principles that operate and navigate in the gray. It's the same thing with teachers. If I only follow the pacing guide and I have to be on this page, on this standard, on this day, they're not very successful, mm -hmm. okay? So we just have to, one, give people permission to try and fail as long as they understand why they failed and learn from that. And then we have to bring our trustees and the community as a whole along. We just have to over-communicate why we're doing what we're doing. Did you have something to add, Mariana? Uh, well, it's just some of the things that, are, that have been resonating with me. Uh, we have this year, for example, I, we are trying a 20% project with the students. So, the, so hmm. I am no expert in half of the things that they're doing. And we have reached out to the parents, not necessarily with a lot of success, because, because of the same thing. They're, they're imagining these really crazy ideas. However, we have given them permission to fail. Literally, it is, uh, you know what, as long as you have a product, doesn't have to be working, and as long as you can explain why it works, why it doesn't work, you are, you are fine. And uh, following, da following Daniel Pink's mo What Motivates Us, we have I have also, I am not grading the project. I'm grading the process and just mm -hmm. in that, did you see it or did, you, did what, what have you learned? But I'm not grading the final product and they know this. And that was a huge shift. Mm -hmm. uh, did I get permission from, from our board or from our superintendent to do this? Really not. But I got semi-permission from the parents in the sense that I told the parents that this is what I was going to try and I was allowed by the parents to, they saw the value in doing something yeah. like this and I was allowed to, well, if it works, really good. And if it doesn't work, well, we'll try something else next year. Well, so. we'll just keep that between us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd just like to add. So uh, one thing that Mesa does every spring, we have Mesa days uh, and the kids compete against one another first within their school and then they win there. And, they, and I think uh, Superintendent Torlickson uh, mentioned how uh, the young ladies uh, from Southern uh, Orange County, I think, won the national competition in the prosthetic arm, 40 bucks, build a prosthetic arm that functions. Mm -hmm. And there's, I know there's a mom mix, missing a salad and fork <laughs> thing, because I saw that arm, uh, that hand. But, uh, but the other thing is the second place nationally was the high school students out of Compton. Um, but one thing that we do go in is uh, when we're, we're looking at where we're going to open a new Mesa Center at the local university or community college and then which schools we're going to select as we do meet with the district and get expectations set, what does this take? Uh, and then also they have to submit a three-year plan of how many students, what type of students, uh, what AG through, how many you know, percentage of H3, A through G requirements. Uh, we want all our eighth graders to uh, complete Algebra 1. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
So going in with those expectations, but then we also have the leeway and the flexibility to know that if they don't meet those goals, that it's okay. Because we can see when, at, during Mesa days, when the students are competing, they're rooting for one, in, one another, but you know, there, there can only be a, a winner, some winners. And, uh, you know, and the parents that attend are just so amazed because they'll come up and tell us that this, he would not, you know, he sure she would not go to sleep until she finished her bridge or until the, got that egg mm. drop uh, container all <laughs> set and ready to go because it was so important to them. And they said, we never seen them. Uh, doesn't matter if all the eggs break, you know, the thing is in, in getting there, right? The journey, getting there. And that's what the parents recognize is that my, my student now is, right. is pushing for more and more and more where before I couldn't even get them out of bed in the morning. So, yeah. Yeah. And oh, just ahead. exactly, and just remembering that as long as the student is learning, we have not failed. Right. I just want to, uh, to get to some questions from the audience because it's a pretty bright group, um, and this was directed to Chris, but I think probably a number of you could weigh in. Uh, how do you scale up a program that works at one school to a large district without reinventing the wheel each time? Oh, that, that is a, a, a great question. I think, one, you have to make sure um, that the planning beforehand, that first time you implement something, you have to make sure, as was mentioned, what is the end outcome, and you're going to backward map in terms of what's it going to take in your one, two, and three, what are some of those potential pitfalls, and uh, how were you able to respond to those. One of the things that we're uh, uh, thinking about doing uh, as we're approaching the Common Core is the ability of joining the New Tech Network. And the New Tech high schools are across mm -hmm. the United States. And there's a, a local one in Napa, Las Gadas High School is just starting their strand. We have a middle school at Leva in Evergreen that has Bulldog Tech. And the concept for me right now is looking at a particular school that will do a school within a school. Uh, we're looking at another school that might be a restart and bringing it forward by grade level. And we're looking at possibly starting a brand new school, New Tech. So it will be three different locations within the district that will be the incubators for project-based learning. And that way you don't have all the pressure fall on one strand or one group of teachers. Mm -hmm. You have a group throughout the district that actually the other teachers can then come and learn how to do it. And they become the trainers of trainer model. Mm -hmm. That's one concept and one way of doing it. That sounds good. Yeah, but we're doing, well, we, Chris and I work hand in hand. In fact, I've offered him an office in my complex <laughs> because he's always there and I'm, I'm always following him around. Um, the, uh, we're creating two mini systems in our district that feed into two of his high schools. And it, it, if you take a smaller system within your system and work out all the kinks mm -hmm. and work out the, how a partnership works, it's a much better rollout than just doing one school, one place. And that's what we're trying to do with uh, the high schools we feed into. We've also are starting to redesign our traditional middle schools to be pipelines into both of their feeder high schools with their technology and their career academies. So we have started the first, uh, we're one of two elementary districts that started career academies this past two years. And they feed right into the career academies in the high school. I have to admit, we cheated at independence. <laughs> when we picked the Project Lead the Way courses, I was teaching aerospace engineering before I picked up the Project Lead the Way course. The other guy had computer graphics, he picked up that course. He was an electronics teacher, he picked up. So we were targeting classes that were almost identical to what we had. Now, once we piloted them in Eastside, that meant any other school could just pick up the class without having to go through the gambit of all the other issues with our curriculum committee. And as was just stated, our feeder middle school has Mesa. So those Mesa kids transfer to us. Their feeder elementary school has Mesa. It just goes right up in a vertical slice. And San Jose State is the sponsor university, that's where we go for all these mm -hmm. activities. So they're just looking from kindergarten through college at a MESA program. And, and I would add that we do a lot of extensive professional training with our teachers, our MESA teachers, and, uh, and uh, 
you know, they, we want them to train the, be the train the trainer right at their schools. But uh, lots of webinars. We switched over almost exclusively to webinars. I give you an example of the mousetrap competition that's coming up. Uh, they're going to start working on it. Uh, we just posted that webinar, and it's just hung out online. The teachers can go and grab it. And uh, we have a mousetrap um, expert at uh, <laughs> uh, USC, and uh, they conduct the thing. And during the webinar, it's uh, learn by doing. The teachers are sitting there with their components, and they have to build a mousetrap car and make it go, mm. uh, and then deconstruct it, and uh, then tie that back into their curriculum. So lots of teacher training. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, could, uh, I could talk all day, which probably some of you are becoming suspicious about. But uh, shockingly, our time is up. But um, that's always a good sign when it flies by, I guess. I, I want to thank you for some real insightful comments. And uh, thank you guys for listening and your comments. Thank you. Thank you. See if you could balance it, right? Thank you, Mike, and thank you, panel, for that enlightening conversation. Um, I want to invite you, by the way, if you check our website, um, this starts at an early age. We have a forum coming up on November 12th on the importance of early math and why you should care. And um, Mike, I want to assure you, none of the panelists are former colleagues of mine. Although the moderator is John Fensterwald, and he is a former colleague of mine. Okay. So um, please mark that down. At this time, I would like to invite Rosemary Kamai, who is our uh, VP of Fund Development, and she wants to thank our sponsors and say a few words about those tickets that you're bidding on. So thank you so much. Um, uh, our sponsors, J.P. Morgan Chase, Microsoft, and Southwest, uh, have been uh, tremendously supportive of STEM education. If you're wondering what that pop-up uh, Southwest uh, 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 pop-up is downstairs, uh, they have graciously donated uh, three tickets, which we are doing a, a small silent auction. The tickets are anywhere Southwest flies in the United States. And many times, if you go to the East Coast, that's very easily $600. Uh, they're right now at $200. And uh, hopefully, if you're interested, uh, all of the proceeds will go to our STEM education. So thank you very much to our sponsors again. So we're going to move right into the lightning rounds. And if you go out in front, uh, we have two rooms. There'll be people that will direct you. And the people involved in the lightning rounds will be at the tables. You'll have an opportunity to, um, there's 12 all together, you'll have time for 10. And uh, they'll have about five minutes to say a little bit about their program. You can ask some questions and then rotate through. And then at 5.30, we have from 5.30 to 6 uh, networking period. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you to all the panelists. And we'll see you later. Thank you.